So, hello, thank you for staying for the second part. Uh, I hope it will be interesting as well. Uh, when Petra mentioned that I'm going to present what happened in Vegas, it's uh, if you know the US you know, culture and all the kind of things, usually says what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, but this will be not that kind of presentation. Uh, a little bit of statistics at the beginning. Uh, so uh, we had, uh, or AWS, had eight uh, reinvents because it started in 2012, so it count like, yeah, it was eight already. This year, we had more than 65,000 people, which is growth since last year. We had 50,000, now 65 plus. When it comes to the number of sessions, uh, breakouts, boot camps, and hands-on labs, almost 4,000. So you can imagine the scale that really uh, reflects the Las Vegas. And of course, it's not just the learning experience, which is probably the uh, interesting for many people, but it's also the social event. Uh, there are things like midnight madness party, receptions, uh, four kilometer or eight kilometer run for healthy people like me, uh, bingo night, board game night, movie night, ping pong tournament, broom ball tournament. Uh, broom ball uh, translated to Czech uh, as fanfarpal. So <laughs> if you don't know what that is, uh, yeah, you are running like crazy over there. And, and of yeah. course, the, the night party, Beside that, Partner Expo, Builder Fair, and many more. What is important or interesting for us for this presentation uh, are the product announcements. Reinvent is the time of the year where we announce most of the new services. This year, it was some more than 70 product announcements. 77, exactly. I saw the number from our marketing. I actually personally counted 53, so I probably missed in that uh, calculation some of them. Uh, but it wasn't just a new product, it was also improvement, the existing ones, and so on. And all these announcements usually happen during the executive keynotes. This year, it was, uh, it, uh, there were, again, four of them uh, broadcasted live from Andy Jesse, Vernon Fogel, uh, Peter De Santas, and, and so on. And so you could watch them over the internet, you could watch them uh, over Twitch. Now they are on YouTube, there are links at the end of the presentation, so you can see them yourself. So let's go with a few services. Actually, the selection of the services, we are not going to go through 77 announcements because otherwise we'll have to stay there up to midnight. It would be bored completely. I just did a selection of the services that um, it's kind of subjective, that get interesting for me and probably for many of my customers. So we'll skip probably half of them, probably more than that. Anyway, so let's start with the computer. I'm the infrastructure guy, so, guy, so this is very uh, interesting for me all the time. Uh, how many of you know there are things like containers on AWS? Yeah, more than half of you, so almost everyone. Actually, now on, uh, on the containers, uh, when you run containers on AWS, you have several technologies. So first, uh, for, uh, on the top layer, you have this uh, deployment scheduling management uh, orchestration tools, which is the ECS, Elastic Compute uh, Service, AWS tools, or managed Kubernetes open source tool. Uh, when you are running your containers, you have two options, or you had two options recently. <coughs> On the EC2 instances, virtual machines, where you have to kind of manage them, patch them, and so on. Or you could use Fargate, which we introduced two years ago in 2017. However, the only option to run Fargate was to use ECS as a management or orchestration engine. Since last week, since reInvent, you can run Fargate on EKS, on Kubernetes as well. What are the advantages? You can bring your existing pods. You don't need to change your code or anything. You can use it as it is. They are production ready, so you can uh, uh, run them quickly. And you just choose the size and run Fargate. Why do you think is Fargate such a big deal for using on Kubernetes? Tell me, any idea? Please, someone. Why it's such a big deal? What, what kind of advantages it brings? No servers. What was that? No servers to manage. No servers to manage. Yes. That will be small Yeshishek today. So please uh, try to catch. Nice. Perfect. Another one. No servers to manage. Yes, it's managed infrastructure. So you don't have to deal any kind of infrastructure, patching, uh, or nothing. You don't have to take care. 
Fargate does that for you. Any other benefit, any other idea? Elasticity. Sorry? Elasticity. Elasticity, yes. A little bit more to detail. Okay, I, I won't push you back. It's latency. Why it's latency? Here's a kind of example that I took from the Werner Vogels uh, keynote. Actually, this is not Werner Vogels, just for your information. <laughs> Imagine uh, that you have application running on EKS, running the old way on the EC2 instances. You have some bad traffic. This is this blue line. So at the you know benchmark, you run, I don't know, 100 requests per second. Then your application becomes popular for whatever reason, marketing campaign, social media, what you got, and it grows up quickly. Then you will get like eight to nine times the normal traffic. What happens in containers, that's the advantage, from let's say let's two, two and two instances that you had, it starts to deploy new ones. However, it takes time. So this provisioned capacity has to react to that. It sees, yeah, something happened, yeah, start some instance, until it starts, it deploys the new containers. Some time passes. So this part of the chart shows that you are under-provisioned. You have requests that you are not able to fulfill. What does it do with your application? <coughs> Latency increases like crazy. So from 160 milliseconds, which is somewhere here, you grow to approximately three seconds. So 30 times more, approximately 30 times more, and when the traffic goes down in a certain moment, then you still keep the EC2 instances until the downscale comes up. So you shut down the EC2 instances. With Fargate, it's much easier. Again, the same case, but due to the fact that uh, Fargate runs on a special hypervisor that we call Firecracker, it's much, it's much faster. You don't need to spin the whole instances. It just spins the pot, the container. So it's able to very quickly reflect the, the growth in the capacity or the request per second. And thus the latency, yeah, there's some spike, but the maximum spike was about one second. So if you compare both of uh, the charts, you see here you are under-provisioned, over-provisioned, while well, Fargate really nicely can copy the whole, uh, the whole traffic volume that goes to your application. And you see the differences in latencies. So Fargate, from latency point of view, definitely makes sense. Good, let's move on. Last year, we introduced several new instance types based on new architectures, processor architecture. So Intel, yeah, we work with them since 2006. They are a big partner, but customers also ask other solutions. So we introduce AMD-based instances and ARM-based instances based on our own processor called Graviton that we developed in-house with our company that's called Anapurna Labs. So, it was working well, customers liked it. These instances are A1, you can try it if you want to. This year, we introduced a new version of Graviton processor called the Graviton 2 that provides seven times more performance four more compute cores, and five times faster memory. Up to the 64 vCPUs compared to the 16, 25 gigabits enhanced networking, and 18 gigabits uh, bandwidth to the storage, to EBS volumes. So quite a lot. And thanks to the uh, hypervisor architecture that we call Nitro, we are able to put those processors in a new instance types. So there are M6G, C6G, R6G. For those that want to kind of memorize, M is, I call it medium, but it's kind of general usage, so I cannot memorize it. Uh, so, but G is the graviton. So these are already available in preview. If you want to use them for your web applications and so on, you can go. C is compute, so that's obvious. R, R is memory or RAM, so uh, you will be able to use those instances next year compared to uh, the standard uh, standard Intel processor based instances. This provides 40% better cost performance ratio. So it's definitely worth trying. 
When we're speaking about the new instance types, we also introduce inf1 instance. Inf1 instance is a special type of instance based on our own chip, again, in-house build called Inferentia. And this uh, inf1 instances bring 40% lower cost per inference. So if you do any kind of machine learning in inference and you previously used uh, G4 with uh, NVIDIA T4 GPUs, you can now, or you will be able to use uh, when this is, uh, uh, actually it is available already, so you can use them and basically get lower cost on the machine learning inferential uh, jobs. You can do training on something like P3 and then you know when you don't have to respond to the requests, you just use inferential. Uh, a few data, like it performs uh, up to 2,000 uh, tera operations per second. It uh, includes uh, all these uh, kind of um, support of all these uh, architectures, uh, whether you are using, you know, uh, CNN, RNN, or any kind of deep learning algorithms. And we support all the big frameworks for deep learning, as TensorFlow, MXNet, and PyTorch. So, these are the typical use cases, whether you do object detection, NLP, natural language processing, personalization, speech recognition, and so on. When we first started to offer EC2 instances in 2006, this was the M1 instance. It had some you know, Xeon processor, less than two gigs of RAM, some local hard drive, 250 megabits network, and so on. This year, you have four gigs, Xeon processor on the Z1. Then we have things like 24 terabytes of RAM. We were speaking about sub HANA and the similar workloads. So I'm sure guys uh, from Energy will be looking for this kind of instance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what else? We have 60 terabytes of local storage, NVMe SSDs, for i3 EM metal instances. And uh, the network, uh, this is still store local storage, 48 terabytes of D2, so hard drive based, and this is the clicker works, 100 gigabits network bandwidth for the top instances that you can use. However, the problem arises with many customers, I already heard that in the last few months, many times. We have more than 270 instance types, and with these new ones, M6G, C6G, and so on, it's even more than this number. How the customer should choose. <laughs> well, it's a kind of art and science at the same time. However, if you're already running some workloads on AWS, we gave you last week the new tool that's called AWS Compute Optimizer. What does it do? It basically checks what you have in your environment running. It checks the CloudWatch uh, logs. It, uh, it checks uh, the, the performance and based on some machine learning algorithms, gives you recommendation uh, which kind of instance you should use for your workload to save money. Uh, what our product team says, it should save you just out of the box something like 20 to 25% of your costs. Uh, this is the example. So you have uh, the compute optimizer that scans the infrastructure, identifies workloads, gives you a recommendation for the EC2 instance type or auto scaling groups and gives you some visualization, some what if scenarios. So based on that, you can decide whether you go with that recommendation or not. When we're speaking about the infrastructure, about three years ago, I was here um, sitting uh, at one bank. I'm not going to name it. And uh, it's not Moneta. And <laughs> those, those guys asked like, the first question. We didn't even start a discussion. And they asked, are you going to bring AWS infrastructure here to our data center? I said, like, uh, what? <laughs> no, we are cloud provider. We are not hardware provider. So this is never going to happen. Well, as it turns out, I was wrong completely. 
<laughs> because uh, there are, despite the benefits the cloud brings to you, there are still applications that need to stay on premise for different reasons. Usually, besides some regulation, uh, it's uh, applications that are sensitive to the latency. So if you're sending data up and down, then of course you will add some latency despite the fact that you might use you know, the nearest region, which is in this case Frankfurt, uh, where you use uh, Direct Connect. If your application cannot sustain like tens of millisecond latencies, then probably it should stay on premises. And you have applications that need to uh, also process data locally. So in that case, probably it's not the best candidate to move to the cloud. We got the option. What it is, it's called AWS Outposts. It brings uh, the AWS infrastructure to your own premises, to your own data center. So it's the same design hardware as we have in our data centers. It's fully managed, monitored, and uh, operated by AWS. So if you order it, if you have several hundred thousand dollars available and you want to have this hardware, we will bring it to you, install. You just provide the power, space, and connectivity. That's about it. And from your uh, infrastructure, from your console, you can manage it as it, if it was like a local kind of uh, infra part of the nearest region that you ordered. This is how it looks like. It's 42 uh, rack. It's fully assembled based on the type of instances that you want to run like M5, R5, or C5. So computer RAM, uh, RAM or general instance based. Uh, you will order, will deliver, deliver it to you. You will connect it, and then you just manage it from your uh, AWS console. There are two options right now available. If you want to run a native AWS, pretty easy, no problem. If you plan to run VMware Cloud on AWS, you can use also the Outpost rack for that. So finally, a year after the announcement that we did last year, reInvent, this is available now. So you can use it. What can you run there? You can run EC2 instances and storage, EBS volumes. Uh, you can extend your own network uh, to um, have some part of it in the cloud, in AWS, and some part in the outpost. Uh, of course, ideal solution is if you have direct connect, so your own uh, line, so you will lower the latency and costs for the data out. Uh, for review, right now it's available RDS, so Relational Database Service, so it's not generally available yet. You will be able to run containers, whether it's ECS or EKS, and you will be able to run EMR cluster, so Hadoop cluster on that. So how many of you know what are the regions and availability zones in AWS infrastructure? OK, so for those who don't know, just quick uh, explanation. Regions are the part in the world where we have our infrastructure. Each region, currently we have 22 regions of them all around the world. Each region has availability zones. Those availability zones you can imagine as a, as a physical data center. So they're actually virtual because they consist usually for, for more than one physical, but imagine it's one physical data center, separated, interconnected, high available networks, and so on, and so on. What is the problem? The problem is, I already mentioned that, the nearest region to Czech Republic is Frankfurt. I hear from many, many customers, not just in Czech Republic. I, I cover the whole Central Eastern uh, Europe, eight different countries, and they ask me, when are you going to build region in oh, some country name into that? It's not that easy. It costs a lot of money, and probably it's not viable even economically. So what we decided to do for applications that are latency sensitive, so you want to have them as close as possible, and you still cannot afford to have outpost, or for, a, for whatever reason you don't want to have run outpost in your own data center, we introduced a new type of zone called local zone. Local zone is a kind of availability zone that is interconnected to the region, but it's not part of that directly. So it doesn't reside in the same geographic area, but it's close, it's interconnected. So right now, uh, we have um, introduced the first local zone in Los Angeles. 
We don't have region in Los Angeles. I think the closest region is Ohio. So it's connected to the Ohio. And if you go for preview and you will try it, you will see it as you know, separate region as part of, or separate availability zone as part of Ohio. It will bring AWS infrastructure as closer to you as possible. Uh, typical services, EC2, EBS volumes, you know, uh, networking, and so on. And if there will be any feedback from customers from more services like RDS, EMR, whatever you got there, I'm sure we'll be able to provide it if that comes from you. The use cases, media entertainment, real-time multiplayer. Imagine any kind of streaming of games. Does it clink? Two, it's probably yes. Uh, some uh, machine learning inference and so on. So how it works, I already mentioned, you opt in, so you have to opt in in the AWS console that you want to use this local region. You will extend your networking, your VPC to that region, and you will deploy your application and run it. That's it, easy peasy. This is not the end of the infrastructure. The 5G is coming. Whether it will be based on any kind of Chinese provider or not, I don't know. Right now, this is discussion probably for the telco vendors and politicians as, as well. However, the problem with uh, the mobile application is if you want to have low latency, you have a problem because you go through several hops. You go from your mobile phone to the nearest cell, to the nearest data center of the telecommunication <coughs> provider, and then probably it's somehow routed through the internet to AWS region. However, if you want to deploy low latency 5G ready applications, you have to use something else. We call it, or we introduce it under the name of wavelength. What is wavelength? Or wavelength zone. Again, it will be zone. The same AWS infrastructure as in the centers. However, it will be hosted with those uh, telecommunication providers in their data centers. So it will be managed and monitored from us and it will be integrated with the G5 network. In other words, it will bring you low latency and high bandwidth options, consistent development experience, the same AWS uh, benefits, and it allows you to think differently about deploying your application. So now you have these four options. You can go with AWS region, you can go with AWS local zone, if you have 5G mobile application, you can go with wavelength, or you can go with outpost in case you want to have the hardware in your own data center. So it's completely new shift in thinking. Uh, currently, we partnered with these uh, telecommunication providers. I actually checked like what is SK Telecom. It sounds like Slovak Telecom or something to do this uh, this abbreviation with Slovakia. It doesn't, it's South Korea actually, so oh. sorry, this is not going to happen. Uh, but Verizon, Vodafone, and KDDI is just the start. Uh, I'm sure we will onboard much more partners uh, later on. So let's go to databases and analytics. Uh, earlier this year, I was doing presentation <coughs> about the selection of the databases on AWS here in the meetup. And um, I mentioned that AWS offers 14 different database engines. You can, have, you can have different relational databases, MySQL, Postgre, MariaDB, and so on. You can have things like managed MongoDB. You can have time stream database. You can have Neptune for graph database. So add one number to those 14. Now it's 15, Apache Cassandra, managed. Uh, database. The benefits, it's fully compatible with Apache Cassandra. There are no servers to manage for you, so it's fully managed service from AWS. It performs at the scale and it's highly available, so it's several times replicated across several uh, availability zones as the other uh, managed database services do as well. Uh, it's fully encrypted, like on the fly and uh, on the rest with KMS, or probably there will be other option as well, uh, but currently KMS. And yeah, you just spin it up and that's it. Just a few clicks on the console and you don't have to manage the Cassandra cluster for yourself, which is pretty cool. Many applications, including serverless applications, have 
larger number of database connections. And this is the things I heard many times in the last approximately a year from my customers. They are deploying Lambda code that is communicating, communicate, communicating sorry, uh, with the relational database in the background. What they end up is they usually just fill all the resources of the database because they run the Lambda, let's say, second or two, then just disconnect and another Lambda runs parallel. They can have thousands of invocations in one second. And if they have too many of those calls to the databases, sometimes they need to bring any kind of caching layer and so on on top of that. We introduce a new solution that's called ARDS proxy, currently in preview. Basically, it adds like proxy layer in front of your database, in this case RDS. And what does, does it do? It pulls and shares the DB connections for input scaling. Uh, it improves the availability and DB failover by not depending on the DNS service in case of the failure of the master. Uh, you use uh, the security and access control that are very well known on AWS. I will show you on the next slide. And it's fully managed service for you. It will be just one click on your RDS uh, console. So how it looks like, imagine on the left side you have applications, usually Lambda or any kind of Ruby, PHP, Python code. It communicates with the RDS proxy that does this three functionality, connection pooling, the seamless failover, and security by, uh, by allowing access or setting the uh, authorization on the IAM and keeps the secrets in the AWS Secrets Manager so it doesn't have to be shared. And currently, in this preview, it's available for RDS MySQL and Aurora MySQL. Uh, Redshift came with few announcements. I will show you two or three, if I'm not wrong. Uh, first are the new instances. We spoke about the new instances types. Uh, what is the problem usually with, uh, with Redshift, what I heard from customers? is uh, they have to set up their Redshift cluster based on the amount of data that they store, uh, which is not always ideal because probably the compute requirement is uh, lower than the data storage, but they still have to over provision and pay for that just because they are storing the data. Here is the answer to that issue, RA3 instances that basically split up the storage and compute in a way that this provides many storage. You will pay only for the storage that you will consume on those instance types. It will add a local SSD for the hot data, and it will use S3 as a, as a layer for storing data that doesn't need uh, immediate access, or you don't need this low latency access, and it will do some intelligent you know, provisioning based on that. And uh, you will pay for only the amount of compute you want anymore, and storage as well. The next thing, uh, I saw many customers deploying uh, the data lakes on the S3. And the amount of data in data lakes grows really, really quickly. When they want to uh, query the data with things like Redshift or anything like that, usually they need to send the data to the instance over the network. With the hundreds of terabytes, or in some cases of petabytes, the bottleneck is the network. So solution to that is to build some caching layer on that. So currently in preview, we introduce Aqua called Advanced Query Accelerator that will cache the data for you as a managed service and it will increase the Redshift queries 10 times compared to the current one without any change in your code. One more from Redshift is the lake export. If you are storing the data in S3, uh, you usually have to or want to have the way how to export the data, especially when you do any kind of ETL on top of that and you want the result of the query save something. So you have to do a special process for that. Data lake export allows you to save the result of the query on Redshift directly into the S3 data lake. And then you can, you can analyze this information with SageMaker, Athena, or EMR. Your logs have information. If you are running on any cloud solution, you know you should store your logs. I have many customers that do this because they want to see all the key performance indicators, they want to see any kind of security issues, and so on. For that, they usually use a service called Elasticsearch. 
probably you heard about it before. Elasticsearch as a managed service on AWS, it's called Elasticsearch Service, a very original name, and it's fully managed service as the other. However, the problem is it's tight couple, just like Redshift that I mentioned before. So compute and storage is the way that you have to think about. Usually, it's the amount of data that decides how big your cluster, Elasticsearch cluster will be. And you have to also take into the account how many terms you need to replicate the data for high availability and so on. One of my customers actually did some calculation recently. Uh, he was deciding whether he will be storing the Elasticsearch data or the logs uh, that they produce every day in the Elasticsearch cluster, or they will use third-party solution with licensing, which was quite expensive. And at the end of the calculation, we found out that from their perspective, they will have to pay this extra license because Elasticsearch was not that cost-efficient cost efficient as they generally thought. It was before we introduced the solution that I'm going to speak in a second. That's called UltraWarm. It's a new storage for Amazon Elasticsearch. Don't search any logic in those naming guys. Don't. Uh, so what it does, it stores massive amount of log data, allows you to run interactive logs, uh, high performance and durability, and it <coughs> achieves 90% cost savings. What does it do? Basically splits this compute and the storage part. Normal architecture of uh, the Elasticsearch cluster is that you have master nodes that basically manage the cluster, and you have data node that keep the data. This is what you see right now, this hot data. If you add there this ultra warm, it will store the data in S3. So this will reduce the cost per GB up to 90%. So you don't have to just uh, drop to the old data or delete it or just flush it because it will be still available in your Elasticsearch cluster. So you can query it, use it for whatever purpose you need. Um, currently, we offer as three petabytes of log data that you can store in the cluster. I already mentioned the savings and this service is currently in preview. Artificial intelligence. Now the fun part starts. So, this is the funny part. Deep Composer. What is the Deep Composer? It's the world's first machine learning enabled musical keyboard for developers. When we, about two years ago, started to speak about bringing machine learning to the hands of each and every developer on the earth, we really mean it. And we do this with this physical device. So, this is how it looks like. It has 32 to, uh, key to octave keyboard. Um, you can play melodies, save it, and upload it uh, to a Deep Composer service that runs <coughs> on AWS. The music you played, you will run through the machine learning algorithm, um, so-called uh, general model. Uh, you choose jazz, rock, pop, classical. Metal is not there yet. I hope it will be soon. <laughs> I will really miss it. And then you can publish uh, it uh, as uh, on your console. So let me just show you a short example. I hope it will be, you will be able to hear it. So this is Beethoven Ode to Joy. Something you can play on that keyboard, right? So you will play it, send it to the, uh, to the service, and then you will choose, for example, rock. This is the example, and you will add other different instruments like drums, electric guitar, uh, overdrive guitar, bass guitar, and this is the results you will get out of that. All right, kind of rock style, Ode to Joy. I miss the metal part, I would like to have it there because I would like to hear something like uh, mm, Smetana's Marblast in a metal version, that would be pretty cool. So this is the way how you can use your musical genes, if you have any, uh, and to play with the machine learning uh, as well. So currently, the only one people that have access to the real keyboard were those that were 
uh, on the hands-on labs in, in Vegas. So you will have to wait uh, for your own until we'll be able to, or you will be able to order it from Amazon.com. I mentioned machine learning at the hands of every developer. So this here, this deep composer, two years ago, it was deep lens, so computer vision enabled computer. And last year, it was deep racer, this car with camera and sensors that you had to teach how to self drive. So you actually have in the deep racer in AWS console, you have the virtual simulator, if you don't have the car. You train the model how to go through the track, uh, test it, and you will see whether it works or not. Uh, when I was doing this myself, I end up, the first part it didn't finish, basically crashed somewhere. Second part it was running and it ended the, the round in like 16 seconds, which I was really proud of myself that I was able to do that, until I saw the world record is about like six seconds or something like that, so <laughs> I still will have to do. So anyway, if you do your model in the virtual simulator, you can deploy it to this actual car and put it on the track. We, we do these deep racing leaks in AWS Summit. Uh, we will extend it next year for five more cities than we did. And then you can like uh, clash the clients. So try with other guys whether you will be better or not. However, this year we introduced improvement to Deep Racer car that it's called Deep Racer Evo. I will show you the picture of that. So this is the bad guy. It's improved, it has a stereo cameras, so you will be able to avoid like collisions and de detect any kind of obstacles on the tracks or other cars, and it has a LIDAR. So the only thing that I'm actually missing myself compared to any self-driving car is just the GPS sensor. But the rest is the stuff that you will get on self-driving cars. So this is pretty cool, I'm really looking forward to uh, drive it myself and, and play. So, what you will be able to do if you don't have the car yet, it's not available, but you can you know, sign up for the interest list. You can already run it in this uh, Deep Racer simula simulator in AWS console, and you can do any kind of community races. I hope that next year I will bring this here, either to Prague or the summit in Warsaw that we are going to have, and we'll be able to do some, some racing and some fun party there, because we have already some models in, in Luxembourg, in the office, just as well the track. So I will do my best to bring it even to the meetup. Um, no promises, but I'll do my best. Anyway, fraud detection. Fraud detection is another area that Amazon has a lot of experience, yeah, retail, right? Uh, there are lots of people that are trying to pay with things like stolen cards or do any kind of fishy things that we have to detect early and make sure they don't buy anything expensive for the money that we'll be never able to provide. And of course many customers come to us like, okay guys, how do you do that? How Amazon does it? Can you provide it as a service? Uh, yes, we do. There are two basic things how you can do frauds. You can do either business rules that are the typical that if IP address location equals to Japan and customer address country equals to Japan and customer phone equals to Spain, then it's probably something worth investigating what's going on, right? If you have the Czech mobile phone and live in Luxembourg and do the order in Luxembourg, then probably you will be also part of the investigation if you will be doing any kind of uh, online ordering just to make sure you are not doing something fishy. The other option is to use machine learning models. Machine learning models are good to some extent because they can better predict uh, the what's happening. And so they are not, you know, if then based. They are basically searching patterns all the of the data that you provide. However, you have to have a lot of data to train the models, and you have to have someone who has experience in machine learning to make sure that you will fine tune the model to fit your requirement or your use case. So yeah, I already mentioned it's difficult and it's expensive because getting data scientists for this job, it's not always possible and it's not easy. So we introduced Amazon Fraud Detector, the new service uh, that will help you to search for the fraud. And what, how does it work? You just upload the CSV file into the S3 with your historical data into the, into the service. 
So this fraud detector loads the data, checks the data for any kind of patterns, uh, does any kind of identity features that you want to do, selects the algorithm uh, based on the output that you want to get. So imagine you choose the, uh, the attribute, basically one column that you want to predict. Imagine if you, typical machine learning model, if you have the size and the price of some apartments in Prague, depending on location, like Prague 1 to 3, you want to get some prediction of how much it will cost. So in this case, like uh, the fraud works similar if the person is fraud based on some, some patterns. So it automatically does the training and optimization. It validates the performance, so it gives you some numbers. So what is the prediction rate in percentage? And it deploys it to the host. Uh, then you can put some detection logic so whether it will have to be um, like investigated or you stop the operation or you allow it and so on and you will just query with the new data against the API that uh, it produces this, uh, these models. Um, SageMaker. SageMaker is one of the best machine learning tools that I've ever seen in my life. I know machine learning is not that old. I'm older. Probably, um, like the real machine learning that we do not do what was happening in the 50s. Uh, but machine learning on SageMaker uh, is the centralized uh, or is the tool for centralizing. We introduced these uh, six different uh, announcements. I will speak about two of them, the first and the last one. So first is the SageMaker Studio. We integrated into SageMaker IDE that will allow data scientists or developers collaboration at the same time on the same data. Uh, it will be easy to experiment because you can track the steps like go, go forward, go back, and so on. Uh, automatic model generation, I will speak about it in a second. And that brings increased productivity because you can easily trace even the results of the machine learning model. You can see how it came to that model, to that conclusion, and so on. This is how it looks like pretty cool. So you have some uh, Jupyter Notebook, then you have some graphs, then you have uh, some trials, results, and so on. The other things, and this is something that I'm really looking forward to play during the Christmas time, is the SageMaker Autopilot. What it does, it automatically creates model from your data. You just put the data in, it does some kind of enriching of the data, check in, you know, whether you have any missing values, whatever. So it does some cleaning as well. I would like to test how much cleaning is uh, capable. I recall when I was here in, in this company in MSD about a year ago, we did some, uh, some uh, machine learning uh, workshop. One of the questions of the people were, do you provide any tool that does the data cleaning for me? Because data cleaning is 80% of the job of the poor data scientist guy, the sexist job of the 21st century. So this tool should do it for you. So now, yeah, we have this. And uh, you will get full visibility. So it will run several uh, algorithms against your data. It will do automatic hyperparameter optimization. And it shows you the results, the prediction rate. So you can, uh, you can choose yourself from several of those algorithms based on the prediction, which one fits you best. And based on that, it recommends the best that you can go with. It's pretty cool. So this is how it will look like and it will go several iterations for you, and you will see some, some results, like 91.1% prediction rate, whatever you got there. So really looking forward to try this one. Okay, developer tools. We're almost at the end. The developer tools, I will speak only about one thing, uh, really interesting, because many customers come to Amazon, beside you know, fraud detection and all the kind of things, with the question, how does Amazon build resiliency into distributed systems? or approach DevOps, or maintain speed of delivery, uh, manage operations, all the kind of you know, questions that you would like to know the answers or the best practices when you are running at scale in the cloud. So the answer to that is the Amazon Builders Library. Basically, it's uh, one place for articles from uh, uh, on the topic of architecture software del delivery by Amazon senior technical executives and engineers. Real-world practices and content is available on the website. 
The website address is this one, awsamazon.com slash builders slash library. Uh, currently, there are something like 13 uh, articles, but of course, there will be much more coming soon. Last one for today, quantum computing. You probably read the articles a few months ago or a few weeks ago about quantum computing at the guys at Google that they um, did some successful operations on top of that. And I recall I had a few questions. It was even here at the, at the meetup. When is AWS going to offer quantum computers in the cloud? And I said, well, it, at the time it will be relevant for customers, we will find a way. So in production, it's not yet relevant. However, scientists, researchers, developers would like to try how the quantum computing works. They want to try some algorithms. So we partnered with three different companies. Uh, they, they produce the quantum computers. I'll show you how those computers look like. So this is one of them. This is from the D-Wave. Looks really interesting. Doesn't look like a computer at all. This is Rigetti computer, quantum computer as well. And this is the Ion Q linear ion trap computer. Like, I don't know. Doesn't resemble any kind of computer. This looks a little bit like upside down Centralny Mozek Litstva from the old series Navštěvníci. So anyway, probably it will be too expensive to have it in your own data center. So we will provide you single environment, like single interface console, to design, test, and run quantum algorithms on these three different vendors, different providers. You can experiment with those uh, hardware technologies. You can run any kind of hybrid algorithms if you want to, because you can combine these quantum computers with something like C5 for example, and we offer expert help as well. We have uh, some kind of lab uh, solution probably right now in US only, but if you have such requirement and you are big enough, let me know, we'll speak about the options that you got there. So currently it's in preview. If you wanna try it yourself, you have to sign up for the preview and wait until we approve it that it's available. So not for production yet, but for testing and trying, yeah, it might be definitely interesting, especially for those who already know what quantum computing is. I don't know very much, sorry. So what we skipped? We skipped 50 services approximately. I'm not going to write all of them. Uh, what might be interesting for some of you might be Lambda provision concurrency especially for those who want to have these pre-warmed containers on Lambda. This is the solution to go. If you are interested in enterprise search, Amazon Kendra. If you want to have automated code tests, Amazon Guru. Uh, if you work in uh, US uh, and in healthcare, Transcribe Medical, definitely. And there are more about security, storage, and networking announcements that I actually had to skip because uh, there is not enough time and attention from your side. Anyway, so if you want to see yourself uh, any details, there are the blog posts available on this category on reInvent. And I put also the links for three most interesting keynotes that were there. Keynote with Andy Jesse, where most of the announcements were made. Keynote with Dr. Werner Vogels, if you are more developer guy and you are interested in Things like show you this latency with Lambda, uh, with, sorry, Fargate compared to the EC2. And the Monday Night Live with Peter DeSantis, uh, our VP for infrastructure. is also interesting to see how AWS build, builds infrastructure in general. So, any questions, guys? <laughs>